Hi, everyone. Welcome to this lecture called Ethics in the New Testament. We can do hard things. This is a supplementary lecture for the students who are in my cover to cover Bible study class. And this is also meant to be a standalone lecture just to hit on a very brief introduction to this topic and to announce that I am working on a Bible study that I will offer in the spring of 2023 on this issue where we can look at things in a little more closely. So ethics and the Christian faith. As believers, what do we do with this, these issues of ethics, especially considering the fact that some of the things we wrestle with aren't talked about at all in scripture. So we have to engage in critical and reflective conversation. This means there's no cancellation in these discussions. We allow honest, thoughtful, genuine questions as long as they are stated respectfully. We engage in conversation with people who don't necessarily agree with us. We wrestle with these things with humility and grace offered to one another. We also, as believers, should be submitting to the authority of Scripture and standing together on its foundation. Um, this is just crucial to a life of Christian faith, that we believe in the Bible as our framework for life. But we also have to recognize that our interpretations need to be offered with humility. There are many right ways to read certain passages of scripture. There are also wrong ways. Sometimes there's only a few right ways and a lot of wrong ways. Sometimes there's multiple ways of looking at something. We could be wrong. We have to recognize that in our reading of scripture. And so here's where the humility comes into play. That's not to say that you have to abandon your ideals, but just be humble about it. Be willing to listen to someone of a differing opinion. It might not change your mind, but if you know you want a well robust well rounded understanding of a certain topic then it's a good thing to converse with someone who doesn't agree as with you because it just makes you hopefully more sure of your footing what we do understand is that scripture itself is not wrong but we can be wrong in how we interpret scripture and then we try to determine the will of god for our community of faith and this is going to differ as well we come from different theolo theologies um, different communities will wrestle with these issues and come up with different conclusions than others this is why multiple denominations exist in christianity um, and so within the community that of where you are worship are a part of this is the issue that you will wrestle with together. At the same time, we have to recognize that we cannot expect the broader society to conform to the way of life that we embody in the church. Ours is going to be um, a, a circle within a circle. If you draw a circle, here's the ethical guidance for all of society. We're going to fit within that, um, and we're going to be even more stringent in what we require as Christians. And so we can't go work our way outwards. We can't coerce moral consensus for the rest of the world. It doesn't work and all it does is lead people away from the cross, which is where they need to go. So much of our convictions regarding ethics are only going to make sense in light of our faith and in light of the fact that we see the Bible as authoritative. The rest of the world is going to think we are crazy or bigoted or hateful sometimes because they don't understand. They don't see the Bible as authoritative. They don't believe in Jesus Christ. So we are always going to be at odds with the world on most if not all of these issues. What are the difficulties in this process? Well, the Bible itself is difficult. It was written a long time ago by multiple authors spanning thousands of years, and we have all sorts of interpretations, including the different ways we actually go about interpreting, and these yield diverse readings of the biblical text. This is why biblical scholarship still exists as a form today, because there's constant disagreement, there's constant, oh, now I understand better, or I've unlocked this key to this ancient language that helps me better understand. So our question becomes, how do we discern a way forward through this? How do we decide which interpretations are best? If there are some that we can say are completely wrong, and what do we do when we genuinely, humbly disagree in our interpretations?
And then in terms of society, as I said earlier, they're going to conflict with our worldview. And so what do we do as people who are called to be the hands and feet and voices of God to the world? How do we follow the Bible and live in the world? How do we stay true to the foundation of faith and ethical values that scripture teaches and yet still reach out to a world who wants nothing to do with us? So for a biblical framework in our communities, this is how we begin the conversation. We read the Bible carefully. We seek unifying themes in scripture. We engage in the process of metaphor making, um, placing our concerns within the world of the Bible and vice versa. Sometimes we have ethical concerns that the Bible wouldn't have even thought about at all. Um, you know, certain elements of reproduction, let's say, um, the ability to have something like in vitro fertilization. They didn't even know that such a thing would ever exist. So it wasn't talked about in the Bible. So how do, how do we find other things that are talked about and kind of use them as a pattern to help us in our thinking? And then we live out the text. Hayes says, no true understanding is apart from lived obedience. By the way, Hayes is referring to Richard B. Hayes, who I used as um, a resource for this presentation. So we live out the scripture in the life of our Christian community. It does no good to understand it. It does no good to apply it to our own lives if we aren't then willing to walk the walk, um, to follow the feet of Jesus and carry our crosses. So when we talk about how to interpret scripture, we talk about this fourfold approach. It's sometimes called the Wesleyan quadrilateral. That's from John Wesley, who is the father of Methodism, but there's a better imagery of a stool where scripture is the seat of the stool and then the legs which support it are tradition, church tradition, reason, and experience. And these three things, the tradition of the church, our ability to reason, our intellectual capacity, scientific dis discovery, and then our experiences as people who love God, uh, these all help us to interpret scripture better. Now, over the history of the church, there have been focuses on different elements within this four-pronged approach. In the time of the Reformation, it was how, do, how does church tradition relate with scripture? They were very concerned with which church traditions to keep and which to throw away. Then in the time of enlightenment, it became all about reason. What does our intellect teach us? What does science teach us? And how do those relate to scripture? And in our times, it's become experience, even more so than reason. There's still something of reason there, but we live in a time in which kind of all truth is considered truth. Every, everything is relative. There's really no foundation anymore. Things that we once thought were almost scientific fact are now being disputed. And so it's become something of experience and often experience tries, you know, people try to elevate experience above scripture and make scripture fit experience, but we're supposed to make experience fit into the world of scripture and not the other way around. Um, also, when we speak of ethical concerns, we're going to be mostly talking about the New Testament, but that's not to discount the Old Testament. I love the Old Testament. I'm an Old Testament scholar, uh, but the New Testament is based upon the Old Testament, and a lot of the the ethical concerns of the Old Testament are just folded in naturally to the New Testament. Jesus was Jewish. His followers were Jewish. His ministry was specifically to Jewish people. So there are certain things that he just didn't talk about. S some kinds of expressions of sexuality, for instance, that he doesn't talk about because it was prohibited, prohibited in the Old Testament and they wouldn't have even thought to engage in those activities. Uh, but then when you get to the New Testament letters, they do come into play because we're dealing with a different group of people who came from Roman society in which kind of everything was permissible, much like it is today. When the NT um, New Testament does go beyond the Old Testament or it reveals something new, it's usually explicitly stated. So an example is the Sermon on the Mount. Jesus says, you have heard it said, and then he'll quote the law of the Old Testament. But I tell you, and often he expands that law and expands our understanding of what it means. But he's very explicit when he does that. 
Jesus' death, resurrection, and enthronement are the central action of God's activity in saving and redeeming humanity and all of creation. Because of that, the New Testament does have special privilege, especially when we're talking about ethics. It becomes the lens through which we look back on the Old Testament and we look forward into modern times and try to figure out uh, how to live as people who follow Jesus. There are several different modes of ethical discourse in the Bible. The first is the mode of a rule. This is like a direct commandment or a prohibition of something. For example, thou shall not kill. That functions in the rule mode. Then we have principles. Um, these are more general frameworks of moral consideration, less black and white, but still no less truthful than um, those like commandment type laws that we find. And they still are meant to kind of govern our actions and our decision making. So for instance, um, an example is Mark 12, 28 through 31. This is Jesus talking about the greatest commandment to love God with all your heart and with all your soul, all your mind and all your strength and love your neighbor as yourself. Um, so then in light of that kind of more general framework, how do we make decisions about the way in which we should live? Then we have paradigms. These are stories about people who model either good or bad conduct, ethical or not ethical conduct. So an example would be Jesus teaching on the parable of the Good Samaritan. In that story, we have people who don't do the right thing, the people who pass by the wounded man and don't offer aid. There are example of what not to do. And then the Samaritan, of course, does stop, renders aid, goes above and beyond to provide for the injured man. He's the example of what we should do. And then we have symbolic world. So these are categories through which we sort of, I guess, the right way to say it is interpret humanity. So for instance, in Romans 1, um, 19 through 32, we have a discourse on human sinfulness. And uh, here Paul talks about, you know, how God created us as humans and understanding the way God created us. Then how do we then understand what is not allowed, you know, or what is um, not in alignment with the will of God? There's no hierarchy of importance with these categories. A rule is not more important than a paradigm. Um, they're just different ways of approaching these topics. A parable, the parable of the Good Samaritan, has just as much truth for us as the law thou shall not kill. Um, they are equal, just different ways of, of addressing an issue. So when we talk about the process of discernment, um, first and foremost, we have to understand that there's no single overarching answer. There's no like golden rule that's going to apply to every ethical dilemma that we ever have. Um, each concern has to be wrestled with on a case by case basis. And then we also have to understand that not all ethical concerns have equal weight in scripture. Some issues are peripheral to others. For instance, caring for the poor is dominant in scripture from old to new testament you find it i want to say in almost every single book of the bible talk about caring for the poor caring for widows and orf orphans um, providing for the people in your community um, over and against sexual ethics those are still discussed about they're not unimportant but they're not talked about as much as caring for the poor so we have to de have to determine as well kind of in a broader picture which areas are the most important and which are of secondary importance. Again, not that they're unimportant, I'm not saying that, but just that some are, are, you know, overwhelmingly should be guiding us as people of faith and probably seeking a broader consensus on those issues that are of ultimate import importance. And then where peripheral issues are concerned, recognizing that maybe there's some room for different denominations to have different understandings. That's a blanket thing, so don't don't apply my words specifically there. Uh, we'll talk more about that as we talk about each issue. So thanks to Richard Hayes, this is his model, and I like it for addressing each ethical topic. First prayer, always, and then identifying which biblical texts relate to an issue and what mode they function in will help us. Sometimes there's going to be none, and that's its own issue. 
Then we want to analyze these in light of tradition, reason, and experience, and how do those inform the way in which we understand and apply the Bible. And then we come up with conclusions and implications, which we humbly discuss in the community of faith, allowing people to kind of push back and push in where they need to on our conclusions. So I'm going to talk about just two topics today because we don't have a lot of time. I don't, I, I'm doing an in-depth Bible study. I cannot cover every topic, even just doing two. I'm not going to be able to cover everything I want to about each of these topics. But I want to give you an example of something that has quite a lot of references in the Bible and something that has none. So the first one I'm going to talk about today is divorce. And there's quite a lot, not a, a lot, a quotation mark, comparatively speaking anyway. There's more um, verses about this than there are about certain other topics when ethics are concerned. So we have Mark 10, 2 through 12. And if you're listening, you can download this presentation at my website, KimberlyConstantMinistries.com. And then you'll be able to follow along better because uh, I'm going to read these kind of fast. So Mark 10, 2 through 12, Matthew 19, 3 through 12, Matthew 15, 31 through 33, Luke 16, 18, and 1 Corinthians 7, 10 through 16. Each of these function in the rule mode. Some of them also have other modes in which they function. So the passage in Mark, Matthew, and 1 Corinthians also can be interpreted as principles. Um, what God has joined together, let no one separate. It is peace. It is to peace that God has called us. That's more of a principle than a black and white, thou shall not get divorced. Uh, Mark 10 also functions in the mode of symbolic world because um, we understand that God created a reality. He created a normative reality by making us male and female and then joining male and female together as one flesh in what he calls marriage. Uh, so this gives a reason for God's rules concerning divorce. Uh, they come from his the way he created uh, us as human beings. Each of these passages affirm marriage as a permanently binding commitment between one man and one woman in which the two become one. All discussion of divorce between believers is to be understood only as a matter of tragic and exceptional qualification to this vision of marriage. So what does tradition, reason, and experience teach us or help us with? So tradition, we've got sort of a mixed bag here. Uh, some denominations are much more lenient. Uh, Protestant Reformation, some of it was about this issue. The Anglican Church was formed because of the issue of divorce. And of course, other denominations are less lenient. Overall, church tradition has tended to expand the range of situations that are considered exceptions to the rule against divorce. And I'll talk about that in a minute. When it comes to reason, there are now scientific and psychological studies on the effects of divorce, as well as the effects of damage caused by a terrible, abusive, or just very volatile marriage. And so we get mixed interpretations. Uh, it depends on the people involved. It depends on the nature of their disagreements, if they have children or not. Um, it, it's There's not a blanket conclusion that we can draw from reason. Turning then to experience. Here we have to be careful because, as I said, in modern society, we tend to elevate experience above all other things. And experience has, in some denominations, kind of made divorce not like an exception to a rule, but created something altogether different. There's liturgical services now in some denominations to celebrate the end of a marriage with wording that affirms a new covenant of divorce. Divorce is not a covenant. God does not call it a covenant. Uh, it's permitted for certain things in the Bible, but it's certainly not seen as a covenant that people make with God. That would be marriage. So this is where experience has led people outside of the boundaries of correct biblical interpretation. We must teach that love is an act of the will, that marriage mirrors the costly fidelity of Christ to the church, and that the power of God can transform and redeem situations that look hopeless.
and experience attest to all of those things. So conclusions and implications about divorce from scripture. Marriage is an aspect of discipleship. It reflects God's unbreakable faith faithfulness to us. Some denominations even see marriage as a sacrament. A sacrament is a tangible way of extending grace into the world. So because of this, marriage is not something that just affects the individuals in the marriage. It affects the entire community of faith. There really are no ethical things that only affect an individual or two individuals. When it comes to ethics, it affects all of us as brothers and sisters in Christ. We are called to be the body of Christ. We all have different functions and we're meant to work together in unity and any kind of ethical um, going against the will of God is going to cause disruption in that. And marriage is no different. Marriage, the Bible teaches us, is a covenant before God between one man and one woman and divorce is contrary to God's will. However, it is permissible in extraordinary circumstances. What are those? Well, in the New Testament, it, those are specified as sexual infidelity or the desire of an unbelieving spouse to separate. But we can also add through reason, experience, and church tradition, abuse as a permissible circumstance, either physical, mental, or emotional abuse. Um, in the New Testament, the covenant calls believers to the covenant of marriage, sorry, calls believers to a reversal of the world's structures of power. So in those days, in the world of the first century, um, husbands had ultimate power. Men were considered to have more reason and ability than women, and uh, men got to make all the decisions. In the Bible, we they are called to do the opposite. They're called to give up their power and prerogative for their wives. And the wives as well are called to sacrificial self-surrender. Both husband and wife are called to this thing. A marriage functions um, when this is being operated, you know, according to God's will. Husband sacrificing himself for the sake of his wife, the wife sacrificing herself for the sake of her husband. Then we achieve marital harmony in line with the design God has for marriage. Because of this, the Bible teaches us that marriage is not about feelings of love, but the practice of love. Marriage is not contingent upon self-gratification or personal fulfillment. It's a covenant that we make before God, and it should be treated much more um, like that than it is in our modern day world. So conclusions and implications from tradition, reason, and experience. We are human beings. Our relationships get messy, and we need a pastoral response as well. We actually see this from the Bible too. Um, Moses says, I had to permit divorce because of everything that was going on in our community. Uh, a pastoral response, Jesus models this for us, is how do we deal with the real messiness, that dustiness that involves humanity? Sometimes one partner in a marriage deeply wrongs another, and the marriage cannot continue despite best efforts. If this happens, the church should extend love and support to both persons. Both people should continue to be fully received into church community and extended the grace and mercy that we all require. Um, divorced persons should be welcomed into church community. This is not something that should alienate you from serving in God's community. It is a regrettable thing. It is considered a tragedy in scripture and in the life of the church. But we also recognize that sometimes it happens. Uh, we want it to be rare. We want it to be um, an exception to the rule. But again, the pastoral response understands that sometimes, sometimes this needs to be. Also, um, concerning remarriage, different texts in the New Testament discourage this and then others leave the door open. This is something we'll talk more about in the Bible study. But if we add tradition and reason experience to this, 
it is the conclusion is that remarriage after divorce should not be excluded as a possibility. We have to consider the grace and redemption from sin and brokenness that could be found and has been found in healthy covenantal second marriages. Um, Jesus was all about grace and redemption and giving second chances. And so again, here is something that I think aligns well with kind of that overarching teaching of scripture. So a couple quotes here for you. It could be that in time, marriage seen as a sacrament and lived as if it were a mystery of grace will become nearly as radical a choice as monasticism, a countercultural thing. Maybe it is already understood properly. And that was from John Garvey writing in Commonweal. I agree with this so much. I think biblical marriage is a very radical choice in our modern day society and very countercultural to every, everything that the rest of the world is teaching us. And if we could live into that and see it as that and teach it as that before couples get married and then continue to support couples, married couples with this type of understanding, we would be much closer to living out the will of God when it comes to marriage. Another quote from Richard Hayes, in making the covenant of marriage, you form a union that reflects the love of God and stands as a sign of God's love in the world. Marriage is a sacrament in the true sense. It is both sign and vehicle of grace. So again, affects more than just the people in the marriage. Another aspect to consider, something we'll think more about in the Bible study, is a theology of singleness. This is where the church has really come up lacking in recent years or maybe in its entire history. We have got to find ways as the church to affirm singleness, both for divorced pe persons and those who have not yet been married or who choose not to get married. We have to find ways to provide deep and satisfying community and friendships and shatter the myth that only married people are normal or that only marriage offers fulfillment. Singleness is an authentic vo vocation, and this is taught in scripture. Singleness is a, is a good choice to make if you can make it. It's encouraged in some places in scripture, and there can be fulfillment in singleness. Marriage is not the be all end all of human existence. So we also have to teach and model that love can find genuine and maybe even the highest expression in platonic relationships. Sexual relationships are not the ideal and they're not the highest form of love. That's not to say that they're not important and that they're not, you know, especially important in the covenant of marriage, but it's not the ideal and we can have deep love without having sex. <laughs> uh, and I think that's a truth society is not recognizing right now. It's all about sexual relationships right now. And that's considered to be the highest form of love. And we are just negating the, all the many other expressions. Um, the Bible teaches a way of love in Greek called agape, self-sacrificial love. And that really is the highest love. It's higher than eros, which is, which is sexual attraction or sexual relationships. And so we want to model that agape love, that higher form of love. And that can be expressed, received, and enjoyed by all people, regardless of if you are married or single. Uh, so the next topic I'm going to talk about is abortion, because this is one where there's really nothing explicitly stated in the New Testament. Um, so I had, we had one where we had quite a bit of verses to look at, and here's one with no verses to look at, at least nothing that says the word abortion. So the Old Testament has some what we might call tangential passages that discuss the ramifications for the murder, the accidental murder of a pregnant woman, and the penalty in that situation for the mother and for the fetus are different. So some say that this makes the point that there is a distinction between the mother and the fetus. You could probably argue for that in a multiple conclusions from that distinction, but anyway, there it is. And then in addition, some point to Psalm 139 verses 13 through 16. Um, if we understood that these function in the mode of symbolic world, here God is depicted as active in the formation of the unborn child. And God is said to know the unborn child even before its birth. So that gives knowing, that gives personality, that gives life, that, that 
kind of elevates that unborn child from, you know, it's not just a fetus, but something that is a life in and of itself. Other modes of reflection. Um, we have to here really look at a broader understanding of the symbolic world of the New Testament. Uh, so John's gospel, for instance, asserts that all life has come into being through the creative agency of God. And we participate in this process by begetting and birthing children. In this way, we become God's stewards who bear life and trust. So this is a high calling and responsibility. Richard Hayes says, to terminate a pregnancy is not only to commit an act of violence, but also to re assume responsibility for destroying a work of God. Whether we accord personhood to the unborn child or not, he or she is a manifestation of new life that has come forth from God. There might be circumstances in which we would deem the termination of such life warranted, but the burden of proof lies heavily upon the decision to undertake such an extreme action. The normal response to pregnancy within the Bible's symbolic world is one of rejoicing for God's gift, even when that gift comes unexpectedly. So the symbolic, broader understanding of the world of the New Testament affirms a high understanding of the value of the life of an unborn child. All issues of life, this includes abortion, capital punishment, assisted suicide, etc., come down to this. These actions presumptuously assume authority to dispose of life that does not belong to us. And we will talk about the other two, capital punishment and assisted suicide. In our Bible study here, we're focusing on abortion. But in any issue with respect to life, um, we have to be very careful because if we make decisions, we are assuming that we have authority over even our own lives. And the Bible teaches us that we do not have that authority that that authority belongs to God alone. We can also look at some paradigms from the New Testament. Um, this is where we kind of engage in that process of making metaphors. So we look at some New Testament texts and we place them side by side to our world and say, do these help us kind of reflect on this issue of abortion? So Richard Hayes looks at three of these. The story of the Good Samaritan is the first. Um, he says, in this story, we're called upon to become neighbors to those who are helpless. The, the wounded man is not able to do anything for himself. We are called to provide life-sustaining aid to those whom we might not regard as um, worthy of compassion. Such a standard, Hayes says, applies to both mother and unborn child. So this parable asks us to go beyond ordinary obligation as Christians. So what would this mean for us in Christian community in response to unwanted and unplanned pregnancies? We'll talk more about that conclusion in a minute. The second paradigm is the Jerusalem community of Acts 4. Uh, Hayes says our faith community should assume responsibility for the care of the needy. And then we create whatever structures are necessary to support mother and father and child. This includes calling fathers to responsibility for their children, born and unborn. And the third paradigm Hayes identifies is the imitation of Christ with several passages, uh, Romans, 1 Corinthians, Galatians, and Philippians. He says, we who are in Christ should willingly give up our rights. Freedom, and, and in these stories, there are freedoms to eat certain foods, for instance, and that's a model of us being willing to give up our rights for the sake of others. We act in service to mothers and fathers and unborn children, the entire church assuming the burden for caring for all involved, even if difficult. So what a tradition, reason, and experience teach us about this issue? Well, tradition... Uh, has a lot to say, actually. The earliest reference in the Christian church to abortion is in a document called the Didache. This was a late first century, early second century document that meant it, that in the Greek means two ways, and it contrasts the way of life versus the way of death, the way of the followers of Jesus versus the way of people who don't believe in Jesus. And among the commandments here in the Didache for the early church, they said, you shall not murder a child by abortion, nor shall you kill one who has been born. And this is from the Didache, chapter 2, verse 2. The entire, entire Christian tradition has rejected the practice of abortion, although there has always been um, 
a, a case, a, you know, extraordinary cases, one that almost has universal acceptance is saving the life of the mother. In modern years, there's been a move to advocate not just for exceptions, but for total abortion rights. And that is a major departure from historical church tradition. Reason, um, this is where most freedom of choice people find their arguments, um, scientific, psychological, philosophical, and legal arguments in support of abortion rights. Um, some of these arguments do stand in tension with the witness of the New Testament. So I'm just going to address a few of them. The first is the rights of the woman versus the rights of the unborn child. Bible teaches that life is a gift from God, a sign of grace. We do not have a claim to it, nor do we have a right to autonomous control over our own bodies. This doesn't mean that other human beings have a right to control us. It means we are accountable to God and God alone, always for our bodies, for every decision that we make concerning our bodies. We have a higher authority, and that is God. Um, there's an uh, argument about the right to privacy or individual choice. And the Bible says all of our actions must be judged by whether they build up our community of faith and whether they witness to God's will in the world. Within the church, doing what is right in our own eyes is a formula for disaster. It, it, that is a thread that winds all the way through scripture. The time of judges ends with that and it's a disaster. So within the community of faith, there is not such a sense of the individual. We really do have to come to community consensus. Um, there's an argument about the sacredness of life. Um, so this would be an argument typically made by people who are against abortion. Um, and Hayes says that this is a false argument, not that it's bad, but just that our prohibition of abortion should not rest on life's value in and of itself. It should rest on our understanding that we don't have claim to sovereignty over life. We are the creatures, not the creator. We don't get to decide what has value and what doesn't have value. We respect life because life is from God. And so it just takes that out of our hands. We don't get to say what life is more sacred than another life. All life is from God. We don't get to make that decision. That's from Hayes' um, book. Another um, argument is when does life begin? Um, and some people saying at the moment of conception, some people saying all different stages within the development of a baby in its mother's womb. But here Hayes says there's no basis for asking this in scripture. It's an unanswerable question that sets a dangerous precedent because it seeks to identify marginal cases or means of exclusion from a rule against abortion. Again, this goes back to the previous statement from Hayes that it's, we, it's not our authority. We don't get to say what life has value. We don't get to say when life starts and ends. We are not the creator. We are the creatures. And, uh, Jesus taught us to bring in the people on the margins, never to exclude anyone. All are welcome into community. All are seen as worthy. All are loved by God. All are extended grace. And we don't get to decide against that because of something that we believe. Um, and so it doesn't matter when life begins. Um, babies, unborn children, children, all human beings, anything. Um, it's all under under God. This next argument is no unwanted child should be born. That's an argument you might hear. Um, and so Christians would say unwanted by whom? Jesus' entire ministry was about welcoming into community the unwanted, the unloved, the outcasts of society, not recommending that they be terminated because no one cared for them. Uh, as Christians, we should want to help everybody. Uh, so even though a child might be unwanted by his or her um, birth parents, that doesn't mean that it's, you know, we fill in that gap as, as the body of believers. And we, we do want that child and want to care for that child. Another argument Hayes brings up, what if Mary had decided to abort, abort Jesus? This is something that um, people who are pro-life will say. And Hayes counters with, you could the other side could say, well, what if Hitler's mother had decided to abort him? Hayes says these are, arguments are moot. They don't hold water because the New Testament teaches us not to approach ethical decisions by asking what will happen if we do something, 
but rather to ask what is the will of God. Again, this just these kind of arguments elevate us to the decision making realm and we are the creatures. God is the creator. And so we seek God's will, God's definition. Um, you know, God's the one that gets to decide when life begins. God's the one that gets to decide uh, who has worth, who's redeemable, who has value. And guess what? He says everybody. So we have to hold to that. It's not our decision to make. So experience, there's lots of different testimonies about abortion. Um, they're inconclusive. There's a wide range. There's people who who have them and have had them and struggle with it. There's people who don't struggle with it. It, it, it ranges across the board. It's not super helpful. Um, in contrast to the debate about human sexuality, which is something we'll talk about in the study, Bible study, Christians do not point to positive religious experiential accounts of abortion. By this, Hayes means most people don't say that having an abortion was something they felt affirmed by God. If they have it, it you know, it's usually if they're a believer and in the church, they are are sorrowful about that, even if it was something that had to, had to happen for a medical reason. Usually it's treated as a right, an unpleasant thing necessary for the sake of women's ability to exercise autonomy and control over their bodies. That's what experience teaches us. So how do we put all of these together? As with all ethical decisions, again, we have to remember we cannot coerce moral consensus in a post-Christian culture. The convictions that should cause us as believers to reject abortion only make sense within our faith and adherence to the authority of the Bible. And the cumulative consensus of scripture is weighted heavily against abortion. But with fear and trembling and humility, Hayes and other uh, people in leadership in the church have suggested that we can identify exceptions to the prohibition of abortion. To save the life of the mother, and perhaps pregnancy that results from rape or incest. Again, there's nothing explicit in scripture, but this is where we apply experience to the symbolic world of the Bible and note that these appeals carry weight. And we can talk more about why in our Bible study in the spring. As the church, it is our responsibility to provide refuge, help, resources, and community, both for unwanted children and their parents, an example that Hayes provides is a retired couple and a church that took in a teen mother and the baby. They didn't just say, we'll adopt the baby. They adopted the young mother as well. And they raised them both with the rest of the church community, providing support. Um, for those who have had abortions, we offer grace and the ministry of healing. No action of ours is outside of the ability of God's grace and mercy to provide transformation and redemption. There is grace upon grace upon grace. Always, always. We do not exclude someone because of this issue. We welcome in women and men who have made this decision in the past and we extend grace and mercy and bring them to the cross and help them to find healing. And indeed you can find healing in Jesus. We also have to do the front side of this issue and address a biblical understanding of sex in contrast to our society's far too casual treatment of the subject. We talked about this a little bit with divorce, but we need to come up with teachings that say sexual love is not the be all and end all of human existence. There are a lot of ways to love. Sex needs to be something that is seen as coming with responsibility. If you choose to engage in sexual relations, then you choose to assume the consequences that go along with them. And guess what? One of the consequences can be pregnancy. And so we need to be teaching this more in our churches rather than being silent and let society fill in the gaps. So we've only addressed the tip of the iceberg when it comes to these issues. And even on these two issues, I haven't been able to talk about everything. There's so much more. It is an intense conversation. It's one that is best done in community. It's one that is done in community where we, we know and accept that we're all doing our best. We all love God and we all love one another. So with that said, I invite you to join me in February. Uh, keep if you want to know more details, my website will announce when I have dates 
uh, ready to go, but sometime in February 2023, I'm going to start a study on the topic of ethics and the New Testament. We'll look at a different topic each week. Some topics might take more than one week. Um, and again, for more info, you can visit my website. So thank you so much for listening and for extending me grace. These are hard things to talk about. Some of you will watch or listen to this that have never met me and don't know me yet. And I thank you for entrusting me and uh, just humbly, humbly touch on these topics because I am a creature and God is the creator. Uh, and so I invite you to discourse on these subjects with respect and grace. I, I am okay if you disagree with me. I invite that. Um, it's necessary. It's necessary for us to grow as human beings. So I hope you consider joining this study. Let me pray for us before we close. Gracious God, oh, how humbly we touch these issues, such deep issues of life and expressions of love and brokenness of human beings and the messiness of what it is to exist in relationships when we are all imperfect people. God, we thank you that your mercy and grace is enough, that it covers all of these issues. We thank you that you love us and you tell us that each and every one of us matters, God. And we thank you that you have created a community, a place for us to come and have these conversations, God, and wrestle with these issues with grace and with mercy and kindness and respect for one another. So God, continue to reveal yourself to us. Help us to better understand scripture. Help us to follow your will and nail our own will to the cross, God, and to just seek you in all things. We love you, Lord, and we thank you for your grace. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.